Welcome to Edges and Sledges, episode 24. We are, you know, just over halfway through the India-England test series. So today we'll bring to you some highlights of what we've seen so far, what we expect to come. Uh, and then we'll end up end up our day and our episode today with some uh, quiz questions that I'm going to ask these guys as always. But uh, before we get into that, I'm Ashwin, hosting today from Cincinnati, Ohio. With me are DJ, who's based in London, and Varun, who's in Singapore. Finally back in Singapore after quite a few episodes this summer on the road. Thanks, guys, for joining me. Uh, you know, it's a fascinating time in the world of cricket, right? Lots going on, lots happening all across the world. Obviously, we're going to spend most of our time on India, England. But I'm going to just start with both of you. Maybe Varun, I'll go to you first. You guys were at the, the third test in Trent Bridge. Uh, you know, some people are calling it one of India's finest comebacks. Some people are saying the sport needed it, the country needed it. Uh, if it uh, just a phenomenal match to be at live, right? Varun, your thoughts? Yeah, it was really great. I mean, when we when DJ and I went there, we were our expectations were not that high because we were two zero down. I think we all expected India to put up a fight, but we never expected this. And from a personal perspective, yeah, I mean, traveling there to watch a game and I think being there live on day one and two was probably the best two days of Indian cricket overseas in a very long time. I think it was amazing that we dominated and we'll get into a lot more detail, but I think the atmosphere was great. We really enjoyed Trent Bridge, the ground. I think it was a it was a much larger ground than I thought. It was a very beautiful ground. So overall, great experience and yeah, great to see India fight back and keep the series alive. So you, you mentioned that a little bit. We Last week, for those of you who joined us, uh, we did a special episode where these two guys were live from the ground three times. Once at uh, lunch, once at tea, and once at the end of the day. And I joined them, and it was a pretty fun conversation. So check that out if you haven't seen it. It was our special episode last week. But, DJ, we talked quite a bit about day one. Let's talk about kind of the, the second day onwards. You know, let's start with maybe the Indian Indian bowling lineup. Uh, how, how Just how good has this bowling lineup been over the last, you know, summer, but also the last few years? I think it's almost been transformed, right? Um, we saw this stat on, uh, I think it was day five, where... Um, the four, four fastest ball on display in that game were all Indians. And Kohli made a point to uh, mention that at the pro, post-conference as well, saying um, post-match conference, saying that he was proud of that and they'd worked hard on their fitness and they'd worked hard on their um, on their game. And they, he was really proud that the four, four fastest bowlers were Indian. And I think Jaspreet Bumrah has actually just transformed the... Um, the look of this attack, there's actual genuine pace there, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, but I mean, seeing him bounce Chris Wokes out was just fantastic, and Hardik Pandya's speed, and I mean, we were at the ground, and we're like, this guy's bowling quick. He's not like just ambling in, and the ball was carrying through, hitting the gloves. Pant was standing quite a way back, and it was just great to watch. I mean, that session, um, day two, was just, I think, one of the best sessions I've ever watched live. Ten wickets in a session, and I mean, I don't think we could have asked for anything more. And then, obviously, we came back and bowled them out again, um, which 19 wickets to the seamers uh, and Ashwin picking up the last wicket of Anderson. And it just shows, I mean, the only other time that uh, the seamers have taken so many wickets was early in the year. Again, with Bumrah, Shami, um, and I think it was Bhuvneshwar Kumar at Johannesburg who took those uh, who took those wickets. But, I mean, it's a, it's a transformed Indian uh, bowling lineup. And Ravi Shastri as well said that he thinks it's the best ever. Indian quick bowling lineup. So we talked a little bit about this before. I mean, it, it's obviously a great time for Indian Test cricket. People are very excited. But the other side of that, and the other reality to that, is we're still two one down in the series, right? This could also go three one or four one before it finishes. Nobody's suggesting in draws at this point because of how the matches have been going. But it's the same bowling lineup that played the first two series, two two matches, except for one guy, and that's Jaspreet Bumrah, the young bowler. Varun, we've talked about him on the show before. Was he the difference this match, even though, you know, there was a Pandya 5-4, there was a good spell by Ishant? Was, was Bumrah the difference? Yeah, I think he was, actually, to be honest. I, I personally thought we're making too big of a deal of Bumrah's comeback, Bumrah's comeback, and he, it's almost like he's going to be our saviour. But <clears throat> something happened, right? He Obviously, his presence in the dressing room... The, I think I think the biggest thing for me is that the team believes he is the strike bowler, right? And he came out and did just that. So I think Bumrah made a huge difference. I'm almost scared to think what happened, what would have happened if Bhuvi played as well, because we know that he gets the ball to swing. So it is. It's a very good time for um, Indian bowlers. I think uh, growing up in the 90s, we always had this kind of complaint that we don't have the bowlers. We don't have the bowlers. 
the lesson for me is it does take a generation, right? It, it can take 10 to 15 years to change a mindset, to start educating from the grassroots level, to build a pace attack where now you've probably got three or four guys who are very good who might not even play once Gubi is back, right? So so I think it, it's it's great all around. I mean, the real heartening thing was, uh, you know, when, when we were watching the second session, there was a group of uh, Punjabi guys from UK sitting right in front of us and they were quite happy uh, by the second session. And one of them actually left, I think the... I think he left his seat for about half an hour or 45 minutes. And when he came back, his friends were actually joking and saying that, you know, you missed eight wickets. Uh, so, so he was kind of stunned and shocked because, you know, to leave for 45 minutes and eight may have been an exaggeration, but to leave for 45 minutes and miss six wickets is unheard of. So it, it, was, it was really great. Yeah, I mean, that's what one of the uh, hypotheses I read from a Sky Sports article, I think it was, is that Anderson and Broad, you know, finally managed to dismiss India early on day two. And then like 35, 40 overs later, they were back bowling again, right? I mean, that, that's that got to be both mentally and physically pretty deflating for them. So pretty incredible. I mean, really, really good stuff by the bowlers. DJ, I'm going to come to you. Let's talk about the man we, or at least I have dubbed uh, India's Ben Stokes. Uh, and that man is Hardik Pandya. Uh, five wickets in an incredible spell in that session that you were talking about. You know, talk us through it. Does, is that just him stepping up because Michael Holding made some comments? There's been lots of negative press. Or is he just a quality bowler that we haven't given enough credit to? I mean, to be fair, we made some comments saying he should be dropped India should play another batsman. And mm-hmm. I think Varun and I both kind of concurred on it last 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 week. <laughs> But if you but if you remember, I, mean, I was I was jumping in saying he was India's second best batsman yeah. or second best full time batsman, if you will. Ashwin is slightly better than him. Um, yeah. So the numbers didn't justify him being dropped, and now he's just gone and bettered his numbers with both bat and ball. Yeah. So let, let's let's just start from uh, day two where he came into bowl. Varun and I were both sitting there, and we saw the conditions, and we were like, "This is perfect for Pandey." I think when we went live from the ground on day two, we said, "If we don't take wickets in these conditions." We are never going to bowl England out. And straight after lunch, Ishant picked up a wicket, picked up Cook, uh, and then Bumrah picked up uh, Keating Jennings. And that's when um, Pandya came on. And his idea was just to keep things tight. Things went very quickly from there. Varun and I were just like, okay, either he's going to go for 60 runs of his seven overs, or he's going to take a five. And people are not going to believe this now, but we just sat there. The second time I asked Varun again, Varun, is he going to take five wickets? This is your last chance to tell, say yes or no. And Varun said, yes, he is going to take five wickets. And I said, yes, I agree with you. Wow. And un- it was uncanny that the man turned up. First ball, he picks up Joe Root. Yeah, that was an interesting moment as well with the crowd because all the Indians in the crowd were convinced it was out, that it had carried, it had... Um, but Joe Root was marking his guard out after seeing the replay on the... Uh, Big screen, and he was really annoyed that he was given out. And I've never seen Joe Root react like that. So it shows he's under a lot of pressure. Anyway, we, we'll talk about that later, I suppose, when we come to the Indi- England team. But Pandya then just ran through everyone, and the catching was stupendous, it was fantastic. Rahul just held on to everything. Pant was taking blinders with the ball swerving and moving here and there. And um, then Pandya comes out with the bat and scores 52 very quickly. And so he then comes out with a strong statement saying, I am Hardik Pandya. I am not the next Kapil Dev. Let me be Hardik Pandya. And I mean, kudos to him. He stood up when he's been questioned. We questioned him as well. What is he doing in this team? And he showed us. He's taken five wickets and scored a 50. And um, and he took uh, Ben Stokes in the second innings as well with the new ball, with the second new ball to kind of completely crush the England resistance. So, I think I'd said in the second test that he does just enough to justify his, his, uh, his spot in the team. Before then, making an about turn and saying he should be dropped for another batsman. But, I mean, it comes back to that again. He's more than justified his uh, his spot in the team. So, I, I mean, I think we all stand corrected and we're glad to be corrected in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. We've talked about how somehow it seems sometimes like other than Kohli, he's the only guy in the eleven who seems to be guaranteed his spot in the side. And Varun has talked before about like, let's just tell him, hey, you're not going to be dropped. Go out and do your natural thing. And it seems like maybe that message got to him. He seemed really comfortable with the ball. He smashed a great 50 with the bat. So all in all, pretty good day with the bowlers. Let's do a quick debrief now on the England, on the Indian batting before we move to Team uh, England. So Varun, let's start with you. New new opening pair yet again. You know, Vijay actually has been sent home from the squad altogether, which we'll come back to and talk about. Uh, you know, 
Pujara seems to have grinded it out pretty well at three, disappointed to miss out on a century. Kohli, obviously, just I don't think there's any more superlatives we can say about that guy. Rahane grinded out really well. Probably the most pivotal session of the match was the Rahane Kohli partnership. Also missed out on a century. Everything just came together, right? Any any thoughts or highlights of this Indian batting lineup in the third test? Yeah, so I, actually, I'm going to share what based on a few observations on the ground, off the ground, and my general thoughts very quickly. So, Shikhar Dhawan, I think he should play in every game. He shouldn't retire. He shouldn't do anything. DJ and I met him live and now we are totally biased because he's the most chilled out guy we could have ever imagined. In fact, I got a couple of friends. So, we have a selfie with him, which you can see in our special episode on Facebook. That's the cover picture. You'll see that uh, a lot of friends actually told me it, it felt like he was more excited to take the picture with you all than you were to take the picture with him. So, uh, Shikhar Dhawan, I think... Uh, we are, we are fans of his because we met him. But on a more serious note, I think he always does this. He always does just enough to uh, to retain his place. Personally, I'm very happy to see Mudli Vijay is out. Um, I think I think he served a purpose in Indian cricket when there was a gap uh, for openers. But I don't see him continuing. Rahul, again, has just about done enough. He didn't look as solid as I was expecting him to. But let's be honest, he, he's in and out of the team again and again. So, again, I would say stick with him. Play him. He did his job in this test. We had a 50-plus partnership both innings. And I think that's what we need. The other thing is, DJ and I spoke about it a lot, right? For the From the English bowling perspective, they're not used to bowling 90 overs. So, it's really important that our openers grind it out, uh, leave the ball when necessary, play, defend, whatever needs to be done. So, I think they did that and that's going to be there. Pujara, I think we were amazed at how bad a shot he played in the first innings. Uh, you could see he was disappointed. You could see Kohli was disappointed. And just g- general demeanor, I was. Um, I, I still believe we need to play Pujara always. But I was just amazed at how Kohli doesn't really talk to him on the field. right? And that, that to me is a, is a funny sign. Because I feel that Pujara is anti or stands opposite of everything that Kohli is trying to build as a brand in this team. So that was interesting for me, but I think he should play. Kohli, no words, nothing to say. All I'll say is be a little patient next time you're on 97. Don't rush into trying to hit a century in, in that particular over. Um, Rahane, pivotal, changed the game. You could just see how much Kohli was enjoying batting with him. Even as they walked off, I think from the second session, I think DJ pointed out to me, he had his arm around Rahane and he was walking off, right? That just shows you the kind of uh, kind of camaraderie there is. And then, of course, Rishabh Pant, I think, great. Second ball, six. I remember DJ just kind of stood up and started shouting in the stand. It, it was great. Right? That was that was great for us. We all wanted to see him play. So, I think the batting is in a pretty good shape. I wouldn't change too much. So, DJ, we'll use this as a, as a quick segue to the English team. But let me just share some quick stats. After three test matches, Kohli has 440 runs. Okay. Um, despite the great match we just had, the next highest scorer is Johnny Bairstow with 206. So, less than half. Then uh, Butler with 170. The fourth highest run score in the series as it stands is our man Hardik Pandya. And then you get to Rahane with 158. What, I mean, after th- I don't remember the last time I saw after three test matches, everybody really is averaging under under 40 other than one guy. So let's start with India. What, like, what Do they need to step change anything before the fourth and fifth match? Do you think they made enough progress in the third match that they feel pretty confident with this top six, top seven being secure? I think they'll be quite confident with the top six, top seven being secure. You... I mean, you've pointed out the players that have done well. Um, a lot of players haven't done well. And the reason for that is the wickets that have been served up by England for this series. And they're not easy wickets to bat on. I mean, Kohli has got 440 runs and he's light years ahead of anybody else. I think Johnny Besto, you said, has got less than half of that. Mm-hmm. He's at number two. But yeah. it just shows right, how hard it is to score runs this summer. And England have done that to themselves in some measure. And India have now seemed to adapt it to that. And they've what we noticed noticeably was well, well, what we noticed in the um, test match was India decided to give the first hour to the bowlers. There were not many flashy strokes. Mm-hmm. Shikhar Dhawan played close to his body. Rahul played very close to his body. We didn't give our wickets away in the first innings, trying to drive outside the off stump or hang our bat outside the off stump. And that once you've given the first couple of hours, as Varun pointed out. The English bowlers are not used to bowling 120, 140 overs in their own conditions. They bowl teams out in 60 overs and they put their feet up and watch their batsmen score runs. It it was a combination of their batsmen not scoring runs and our batsmen blunting them with the new ball. You saw how quickly we got blown away with the second new ball on the second day. 
and that is the key period that india seemed to have negotiated well in both innings that they've scored over 350 runs and i mean i think gavaskar has said it brian lara has said it all of them have said it the first hour is the bowlers and the rest of the day is mine and india seemed to be following that and we need to follow that for the rest of the series the other interesting thought was why did joe root put us into bat and there's been a lot of discussion about this um and he thought that we'd get blown away like we were in at lords and we showed a lot of character to come back but do you guys think that was the right decision i mean joe root deciding uh, winning the toss and deciding to bowl first ashwin i don't know whether you had any thoughts on that yeah i i i don't think it was the right call but i do understand why he did it right coming up from two nothing let's remember what happened at lords right it was it was a very 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 bad match like we were so deflated after that match it doesn't surprise me that the english captain could have said hey let's try and wrap this up in 3 days again go out to smith them quickly put on a huge total and win by an innings so i i it, I don't think it was the right call. It's easy to say that in hindsight, but it doesn't surprise me that he wanted to give his first hour, like you mentioned, to arguably the best bowl, the fast bowling pair in the world still right now against a lineup that's been shaky against them. So, good thoughts. I wanted to use that to talk a little bit more about the English batting. So, Varun, I'll start with you because you talked a little bit about Root. But Alistair Cook, averaging 16 in the series. Keaton Jennings, averaging 18 in the series. Forgetting the stats, they've just both gotten out to what feel like pretty poor shots. You know, poor shot selection. Keaton Jennings consistently flashing outside the off stump. What is England? And and by the way, you know, even if Alistair Cook doesn't get dropped because thirteen thousand runs is no, is you know, deserves a little bit of time. Uh, he probably doesn't have more than one or two years left. So is England now going to be looking for an entirely new opening pair in the next twenty four months? And and what do they do with that? Yeah, so I think I so I've been really disappointed with the English openers. I think they uh, have been known to put up a lot more runs in the past. I know Cook is a star player of course but you're right i think the key thing that you pointed out is they've got out to average kind of balls or they've not got out to spectacular like even uh, cook getting out to ashwin in the same fashion two ways in a row i just think they're out of form and it doesn't help that they i don't think they have another opener i mean correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think they have another opener in the pipeline they have been struggling for this specialist batsman kind of approach and that's why you're seeing Milan in, Vince in, uh, Pope in. So I think they need to get their uh, their batting lineup kind of sorted out a little bit. I I also don't think it's a bad idea to see if one of these three names I just mentioned wants to consider opening in, in case they, they they need that right because you're kind of sorted lower down the order. But yeah, I mean to to put it simply, I think I'm I'm quite disappointed. But what's interesting is Root has backed both of them and they will play. While India is bringing in changes like sending Murli Vijay home, bringing Prithvi Shaw in, which we can talk about later. Joe Root has said, I'm going to back the openers. So so I think that's interesting. DJ, one of the things that happened in this match was, you know, as many English fans have actually been in hoping, is Butler took the gloves. Now, it didn't happen for the right reason. It happened because of a Bairstow injury. We don't yet know if he's going to play. And I can most likely say with a fracture, if he plays, he won't keep. So with Butler now, we could keeping Johnny Bairstow gets more of a responsibility with the bat. I personally think that's the right thing. I've been saying for a while, I think he needs to bat as a full-time batsman at number, you know, own that number four spot. Uh, what do you what do you think England should do with their batting lineup? You know, what is what role does Ollie Pope play here do they should they try and mix it up or just stick to what's been working so um it's interesting you mentioned ollie pope because ollie pope has never batted above uh, number 6 for his county and suddenly he's batting against the world number 1 test team with a potent attack uh, against uh, at number 4 he's never come in before the 23rd over in a first class match and he's been in i think in the 9th over the 12th over and the 16th over or something there's some stats like that so there's been a lot of chat i've been listening to tms i've been listening to like the sticky wicket podcast there's quite a lot of podcasts out there which are discussing from an english perspective and there's panic in the ranks right they want best to open the batting they want best to bat at 4 they want ollie pope to go down at 6 they want butler to keep wicket they want alice to cook to drop down to 3 rory burns was being talked about as an opening option so it's really interesting and if you hear some of the english fans talk they are now in complete panic and they are talking about don bradman's team from 1937 637 that came down from 2-0 down to beat england and they they're comparing kohli's india who were complete no hopers at lords apparently to to that team so it's so quick that the cricketing public is kind of and the cricketing media has just turned on the english team and it actually made joe root come out and say hey guys we're 2-1 up this is not the end of the world so just remember that we're still 2-1 up the series got two games to go but i mean we've had one bad game and it was interesting that they also pointed out that we had one close game india were blown away at lords and then india blew england away so it's close series uh, coming back to the batting order um 
I think Jennings and Cook, and I, I and I slightly disagree with Varun on this. I think Jennings and Cook, India have worked those guys out. We have two very good bowlers to left-handers, but three, I'd say, with Ashwin. Bumrah, Ashwin, and Ishant all take a high proportion of left-handed wickets. And I'm sure if you do the stats, they take... Uh, they they're very very good against left-handers, and having two left-handed openers who are out of nick has just played into India's hands. And I'm actually quite happy to see them fail because I mean Varun was disappointed that Cook didn't score, and I mean it's good. <laughs> I mean we've seen our batsmen fail in these conditions, and we've got lots of like uh, chat about how Indians can't play swing and this and that. I mean you saw how it is when the conditions are against the English batsmen. They're not very good against the moving ball either. So, I think it's going to be Cook, Jennings. Three will be Root. Four, I think, will be Johnny Besto without the gloves. Five will be Ben Stokes. Six will be Oli Pope. Followed by perhaps Moin Ali, who's back in the squad after a double hundred uh, and six wickets or something like that. Six wickets in the same one game. Innings, eight, eight wickets in the match. Oh, insane. Uh, so, I don't know whether he'll make it back. I doubt it, given Rashid's bowled pretty well and batted decently. Um, and I, I also I also think Moin Ali, I can't remember, but I think he did very well at Southampton last time India played there. Yeah. I think he took a similar eight eight wickets and hit a century or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think B- Butler was the big revelation for us. I think he batted, Butler and Stokes in the second innings batted beautifully. And uh, someone was saying they should make a DVD of that partnership and just watch it on loop because that's what test batting is. And people are really annoyed that Root has scored a has got a contract with Sydney Thunder and T20 is ruining the game. And I don't think that's right because the three best batsmen in the world, Smith, Kohli and Williamson, I'm leaving Joe Root out of that category for the moment given the form that he's in. And he hasn't really been scoring runs. He hasn't scored a test century for over a year now. All play all three forms with success, with immense success. Smith, Kohli and, and Williamson play the IPL with a lot of success. So, for Root to go out and play T20, I don't think it's an issue. If he wants to become the world's best batsman, he has to do it. Yeah, fair enough. I think that's totally fair. All right. Last question on this topic, Varun. I'll start with you because you mentioned them. But, you know, the news that we heard earlier this week is Murli Vijay and Kuldeep Yadav were sent home from the India squad and they brought in two new young batsmen, Prithvi Shaw, who plays for the Delhi Daredevils, and Hanuma Vihari, who's less known, but averages almost 60 in first-class cricket. He's 24 years old. He uh, has the highest current first-class average of all players playing at the moment so pretty pretty incredible stuff one one thing i heard on a different podcast this week was i think charu sharma says on the said on the bbc stump podcast that you know when you start bringing in these 19 20 21 year olds in a side that's got mostly late 20s and early 30s players have we just skipped an entire generation like where are all the batsmen aged kind of 24 to 29 where have those guys gone? And are we getting overzealous and bringing in Rishabh Pant and Prithvi Shaw's of the world? Or is it the right thing? Because, I mean, hey, Sachin became the best batsman in the world because he started early and was able to grow from a young age. So thoughts on bringing in youth? Yeah, I'm a big fan of bringing in youth. I think uh, what happens in most teams is over a 10-year period, a lot of your talent who has to be, or who unfortunately has to sit out, just miss out on that chance, right? So all those 25 to 28-year-olds, um, they're not going to get a chance to play in the last five to seven years. And I think I think it's the right move to bring in these youngsters. Rishabh Pant, Prithvi Shaw. Okay, I'm personally very excited with Prithvi Shaw because I think India has an opening problem. I think to, I don't think he'll get a chance to play, but I think it's the right move to include him. Vihari, I know he's got a great domestic record. I don't know much about him. But again, I was a little surprised with his pick because, um, let me ask you, is he an opening bachelor or a middle order bachelor? I think he's middle order, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, he, he's so middle order. No, yeah, so again, I think there's no issue with the middle order right now, right? You have got enough people. So, I was shocked with the, the Vihari decision, but Prithvi Shaw very happy. And the only thing I would say is Kuldi Yadav is a class act. He just It's just tough condition. So, I would actually take this time to kind of work on my red ball cricket if I was him and, and come back. DJ, final thoughts. What is the uh, What are the two 11s going to look like? Any changes for either side going into Southampton? Um, it's an interesting question because I was wondering whether Sam Curran comes back into this team and where he fits in. And I don't see where he fits in after Ben Stokes' performance with the bat. He was Ben Stokes looks rusty with the ball, but with the bat he looks fine. I mean, unless England choose that variety, which I think they sorely missed at missed at, at uh, Nottingham. So I think England's eleven will look the same. I don't see them making any changes if Bairstow is fit. Mm-hmm. 
I think India's 11 will also look the same. Ashwin is the only person who I think will not, uh, it depends on his fitness, right? Whether he, if he's fit, I think he plays as the number one spinner. Otherwise, it will be, as, as I think you've been wanting for a while, it'll be Jadeja. But I don't see the teams now at this juncture in the series actually changing personnel. And I mean, it's we've got to that point in the series where our captain has scored so many runs and he's in good form and the momentum's with him and with the Indian team. And you can see that England are struggling with their two best batsmen not having made runs. And there's pressure on Cook and Root and it's just such a different dynamic. They've scraped through two, well, they've scraped through the first game and won the second game handsomely uh, with the conditions in their favour. But I think that's going to be a huge factor. I mean, Joe Root is backing Alistair Cook, but I mean, he's got to back Alistair Cook after he's made runs. Well, yeah. Joe Root himself has made runs because yeah. he's been woefully out of form. Okay. So, in summary, no, no changes. I no think. changes for either side. Varun, for you quickly. Yeah, I also don't. I think India will have one change, but I really, because Kohli has to make a change. But uh, something tells me Jadeja will play. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. I think it depends on Ashwin's fitness. But if he's anything short of 100%, I think it's too much stress. I do think it's harsh, but I do think Sam Curran might come in and Chris Wokes will make way. Uh, just for the variety, I think Chris Wokes has earned his spot in the side. But you're not going to drop Anderson in broad and Stokes brings too much with both bat and ball. And so I think Wokes will make way for, for Curran to have the left arm seamer. Okay, we're going to do a quick wrap of other quick things that have had happening in the world of cricket, just to summarize for you guys. So we heard from the world of women's cricket, veteran pace bowler Jhulan Goswami retired today She uh, this week. She was the highest, or still is, the highest wicket taker, wicket taker in the world in the women's game. So obviously sad to see her go, but great illustrious career for the sport has done so much to bring you know women's cricket to the forefront, and hopefully that'll keep growing. So that was one big piece of news. Ireland and Afghanistan are playing a, a, a series where Afghanistan won 2-0. The third match was just rained out. This was the T20 series. So exciting time seeing this young new nation we've talked a lot about on the show, uh, you know, continue to go around the world and dominate. And we're pretty excited to see, you know, that matches being hap- matches being played between teams like Ireland and Afghanistan. So that was really great. And then lots of other leagues going on, right? There's the there's the, the series in England going on. The quarterfinals are play- taking place. There's the Caribbean Premier League happening and now there's other series like the Sri Lankan Premier League kicking off so if you need your fix of T20 there's plenty going on across the world at the moment so with that we're going to wrap up today guys with a quiz so DJ mentioned this earlier today but one of the highlights of the third test was catching Uh, and so all of my questions today are either about catching or wicket keeping are you guys ready to go all set okay now let's do this. Okay. Yeah. So the same format as last time. I have eight questions uh, for each, and I'm going to go one by one. So I'm going to toss. Who wants to call? I'll call. All right. Call. Heads. It is tails. DJ, do you want to go first or second? I'll go second, ma'am. You go second. All right, Varun, first question for you. And start. The first two are pretty easy. Um, but is, is this from a specific series or something? Or? No, I'll, I'll specify if there's a specific, but otherwise this is all. Okay. This is all test cricket. That's the only specification. All test cricket in the spirit of what we're going through. Question one, who has taken the most number of catches uh, in test cricket outside of, like, excluding wicket keepers? So, fielding catches. Uh, oh. One guess, and if you don't get it, other guy gets half a point if they steal. I thought this was an easy one. David? That is correct. 210 right, catches. Answer. Uh, so one point for Varun. I gotta start keeping score. DJ, same question, but who's taking the most catches uh, for England in all all time? Easy man. Uh, including wicket keepers or excluding? No, sorry, wicket? excluding fielding. Um, Alistair Cook. That is correct. 168. He's number four on the list, I believe. One all, guys. He's dropped about 368. <laughs> <laughs> Just playing that many matches at some point, right? Uh, who Varun? Who? Which keeper has taken the which wicket keeper now has had the most dismissals in all time test cricket? This one's a little bit tricky. Uh, I think Sangakara. No, that's incorrect, interestingly. DJ, can you steal? Which wicket keeper has taken the most number of dismissals in test cricket? I think it's um, Mark Boucher. That is correct. Good guess. Five. Oh, wow. I know the answer, man. Yeah, fair enough. So that's a half point. He was point like, he was yeah. about to play his 100 test or 150 yeah, test. Yeah, so like, interestingly, so. he's got 505 dismissals, um, yeah. more than any other keeper by a long shot. And he had 998 mm-hmm. dismissals in total. So two short in, across all yeah. formats. Two yeah, short yeah, getting a thousand. 
So the score is one and a half for DJ, one for Varun, and now it's DJ's question. DJ, which player has the biggest delta in their batting average between when they were a wicketkeeper and not playing as a keeper? So the same batsman, same player played as a wicketkeeper for some time, non-wicketkeeper for some time. Who had the biggest uh, delta in the average, batting average? Raul Dravid. No, that is incorrect. Varun, do you want to steal? Yeah, A.B. de Villiers. That is also incorrect, actually. The correct answer Damn. is Kumar Sangakara. You just mentioned him. Oh, but man. He, he's average. He played 79 innings um, as a keeper and averaged 39.5. And then he gave the gloves off, played 154 innings after that, and averaged 66.9. Insane. So there's only wow. a, I thought that was a fun one. That, um, That's a great reason. It's quite a hard reason. question, though. Yeah, this is a tricky question. They all it doesn't get too too much easier from here, but they were fun. So uh, also, also for anyone listening, I believe uh, Sangakara has done a Nasser has sent a masterclass with Sangakara. Hmm. I think on Sky Sports. So if anyone can uh, catch that, it's really great because Sangakara is giving some great tips and giving Rishabh Pant some advice. So so it was very good. I personally also, love listening to him as a commentator. It's so always also so Sangakara took a selfie with us. Like he asked <laughs> yeah. for a selfie and we posed with him. So it was okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Okay, Varun, back to you. Score is still one and a half to DJ, one for Varun. This one is slightly easier because you hadn't had an easy one. Who's who's taken the most number of dismissals as an Indian wicketkeeper? Um, I want to say Nayan Mongia, but I won't. Uh, Dhoni. <laughs> that is correct. He's fifth on the all-time That, was, that was a complete cheap move. <laughs> I want to say Nayan Mongia, but I won't. Oh, come on, the yellow, the yellow helmet, that, man. That's clearly too. No, yellow. dude, I was just making a joke about Nayan Mongia and his yellow helmet. I want to say, but. All right, uh, <laughs> let's keep going, DJ. Unfortunately, Jeez. you're getting the tough questions because of the way you decided after the toss. But this is a because you won the toss and put me into bat. Yeah, this is true. That On a flat wicket. A little bit arrogant. <laughs> okay, this is another fun one. Since 2010, this one is only since 2010, other than MS Dhoni, who we just mentioned, who is the only wicketkeeper captain to have made a century in the last eight years? So since 2010. There have been a lot in the in the old world, but that's why I limited this one. Indian? No. Only wicketkeeper captain, like test captain for their nation, who was also wicketkeeper and also scored a century. This one is a bit tough. A bit tough. Uh, Sarfraz? Uh, no, no, you're close. Varun, can you steal? And now you confuse me with what is your, your close. I shouldn't have said anything then. Why? What were you yeah, going to say before? Cheap. I think we steal it, over now. Is it proximity close? Or, uh... Oh, shit, I, 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 uh, No, you're not. On, what, your, your guess is that. Varun, I'm can off. you steal or no? McCullum? No, no that's I, not can, I, can I try again? Yeah, but you don't get the point for it. It's the Bangladeshi wicketkeeper, man. Mushfikur Rahim. That is oh, Mushfikur Rahim. Four, four centuries as captain in the last eight years. Dhoni is the only yeah. one who has more with five. Okay. Was, Ajay, uh, who's the yeah. who's the Sri Lankan keeper after Sangakara? There was a, there's been a lot, right? There's been that Silva guy, and I don't know. There's been a lot of keepers since. Okay. But he just okay. he basically played as a specialist batsman for the last. Lanka de Silva. Lanka de Silva. Lanka de Silva that's his name. <laughs> Okay, last two questions, guys. Uh, I think this is... It's still uh, one and a half to two. Varun has two now. You have one and a half. Oh, so this oh, is it. And these are also these ones are also pretty tough, but I had fun pulling them. So we'll take it as it goes. Varun, who is the most successful bowler and wicketkeeper combination for India of all time? So combined dismissals for a bowler and a wicketkeeper. And this is an all time. This is no all time? Matter. Like for India? Yeah, yeah, for India. Yeah, but across all periods of time. Uh, uh, I'm tempted to say. No, 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 no. One guess. Just yeah, yeah, say one guess, one guess. Don't be tempted. Zaheer Khan and Dhoni. You know, that's not a bad guess. They're third on the list for India. The first one you have to go a little yeah. further back. DJ, can you steal? So this includes wicket keepers or not? Yes, only wicket keeper bowler combination. So who's the only most. Only wicket keeper. Like, who's the most successful wicket keeper bowler pair? So Dhoni, uh, Dhoni and Zaheer was a really good guess, actually. They're third. But anyway, DJ, can you steal quick? It's going to be Kumble and Mungia. No, that's also not correct. The right answer is Kapil Dev and Saeed Kirmani from the 70s and 80s. Oh, wow. The second oh, wow. answer, which I thought was interesting, which I would have given a half point if somebody got, was Ishant Sharma and Amaz Dhoni. 
which I wow. was to buy. But anyway, I guess they overlapped the most. So I need um, to get this to win. You need to get this to win. DJ, same so question. Then. Same question. Most successful wicketkeeper bowler combination for England of all time. Of all time. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Who's ever going to know the answer to this? Yeah, but the second, fourth, sixth and eighth questions were harder. So I thought whoever would win the toss has an advantage. But I guess not. <laughs> But how do I know which ones are harder? When I win the toss. Because you have to see the trend. Do you remember what I did when I won the toss last? I batted first and I got a question like some really ridiculous one. Okay. Like what color jersey does India wear? It's Jimmy Anderson, Matt Pryor. Holy shit. Sorry. Well played. Well wow. played, sir. Steals it. Well done. Extra half point. Unless Tony got, finishes it off in unless, style. Unless he's got a browser. Actually, Matt, Matt Pryor finishes it off in style. Matt Pryor <laughs> throws the bat against the Lord's balcony again. That breaks that, the window. Unbelievable. I did not expect you to get that one. So that is, what is it? Two and a half points to two. DJ takes the game by a half point. Fantastic. Matt Pryor and Jimmy Anderson are ninth on the all-time list, actually. Um, with 68 combined dismissals, uh, but the highest for England. Oh, everybody nice. That's everybody a great quiz, man. Well done. It's awesome a fun quiz. question. It's a great question. That's basically it. If you guys have nothing else to add, I think we'll call that the end of our episode for today. DJ is now takes back the title uh, of the quiz, quiz legend. But we'll join you again next week. Hopefully be back with another quiz hopefully in the midst of a really exciting uh, fourth test match taking place at southampton and we'll debrief with you there as well thanks for joining us as always uh, like share subscribe you know if, if you listen to us through podcasts wherever you listen give us a rating that helps us spread the word uh, thank you guys for joining it's a special day for us to be recording the podcast because for varun and me it's our mom's birthday so happy birthday to mom in case you're listening and we will see you guys next week thank you